Topic, it's Botanical Science for Beginners. I am James Stevenson. I'm with the University of Florida Institute of Food and Agricultural Sciences, Pinellas County Extension, a cooperative with our local government, Pinellas County. Coming to you today from Pinellas County's largest natural area, Brooker Creek Preserve in the north part of the county. We've got a lot of slides to get through today, and I know the topic might be a little daunting. Uh, we used to chase people away with a class called Botany 101. It was just too much. So we thought we'd rename it Botanical Science for Beginners, because face it, we're all beginners at something every single day, aren't we? If we wanted to define botany using the scary words, we've got the Oxford Dictionary of Botany's description here. Uh, with all these terrible, scary words like anatomy, morphology, physiology, biochemistry, taxonomy, cytology, la, 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 la. How about for today, let's define botany as looking at some really cool things about the plants that surround us all the time, just things that we've never really thought about. Does that suit? Let's go with that premise today. Now there's of the land plants, there are about 400,000 different land plants. And they occupy a whole myriad of, well, every single habitat that the earth has to offer, uh, from undersea uh, to the steamy and dark jungles, uh, adaptations to life where the sun hardly ever shines and it snows all the time. I mean, can you imagine trying to be a tree in this kind of uh, habitat? But here at Brooker Creek, you can see we even have uh, adaptations, plants adapted to our upland, our dry uh, woodlands, and also our flooded swamps. An, a sister preserve right here in our county uh, kind of complements the whole upland and freshwater wetland. It's our coastal habitat. So between Brooker Creek Preserve with its upland and freshwater wetlands and the coastal preserve at Whedon Island down in South St. Petersburg. We have about all the plants that have ever been found right here in Little Pinellas County on our two large preserves. So what is a plant? What are these things that we're going to study when we're looking at botany? Again, using the scary words from Merriam-Webster, uh, kingdom plantae, multicellular, eukaryotic, uh, blah, blah, cellulose. Um, let's simplify that for today's purposes. Living thing made up of lots of cells that take sunlight and turn sunlight into sugar. Can't move or feel and has a very special cellulosic cell wall. We're not talking about fungus. Fungus do not belong to botany. They used to. The fungus used to belong to the botanists because many, but not all, in fact, not most uh, fungus tend to pop up out of the ground like a plant. And as such, the fungus were handed to the botanist to study. It turns out that fungus belong to a completely different kingdom. We have animals, we have plants, and we have fungus. So fungus will treat completely differently in a different lecture, but not today. So we have plants. How are we going to take all those 400,000 different plants and break them down into manageable little uh, divisions? Uh, we, can, we can look at the trees. That's a good division. We can look at vines, flowers. Those are very important. Uh, vegetables economically important and nutritionally important as well, and weeds. Uh, but these are not scientific little bunches of plants. These aren't scientific um, uh, categories of plants. These are subjective. Uh, one person's tree could be someone else's very large shrub. A weed to some might be a vegetable to another and so on. So let's take a look. As now, as of uh, five minutes ago, we've all become botanists for the day. Even though we're just beginning, let's take a look at the basic breakdown of plants. There are only four kinds of plants. 
And I betcha by the end of today, you can look outside and if you can stand it, you can walk outside and decide which of the four different groups of plants you're looking at. They all fall under one of these four categories. We've got the mosses, which have a very simple structure. That means they have no roots or stems. They have no plumbing. They reproduce by spores, the mosses. Uh, they are not what's hanging in the trees. That's actually a flowering plant and we'll get to those a little bit later. These are very, very low growing. Uh, they don't have any, like I mentioned, they don't have any, any plumbing. They have no way of moving water through their bodies. Moving up into, um, move, excuse me, moving up into complexity uh, where we do have these roots and stems and leaves. We do have that plumbing. Uh, that vascular system, but still reproducing by spores. We have plants with leaves, we have plants with roots and stems, but still with this very basic reproductive method of reproduction by spores, we have this group of plants called the ferns. So if it's not a moss growing very close to the ground, if it's grown up a little bit, but still reproducing by spores, we call that group of plants the ferns. Moving on in a little bit of complexity, we have the plants that reproduce via seeds. Uh, so you plant a seed and that seed has a little embryo inside and that embryo grows into the next plant. Um, within those, we have a very simplistic, albeit sophisticated, uh, way of developing seeds in cones. So we have that group of plants that are called the conifers. Uh, these would be, the, of course, the pines and the junipers all the, the firs, if you're from further north or west, uh, this group, the conifers. And finally, everything else, all other vascular plants that can get up off the ground, that can grow taller than mosses because they have the roots, the stems, and the leaves. They reproduce via seeds, but they produce a special structure called the flower. And flowers can challenge you. They can be very, very, um, very, very small and they can be very challenging in the fact that they might not look much like a flower that you might envision in your mind, but everything else out there that isn't a moss, a fern, or a conifer is a flowering plant. The grass on your lawn, is it a moss? No. Fern? Mm -mm. Is the grass a conifer? Nope. The grass on your lawn is a flowering plant. So everything else is a flowering plant. So let's look at these four major groups in person. We've got the mosses, uh, this is again that very low growing, uh, nice, em usually very emerald green, oftentimes growing in damp and shady places because it doesn't have that vascular tissue. It can't move water through its tissues, so water has to move across the plant in order for it to use these scales that it produces instead of leaves to grab that water and hold it uh, with surface tension and uh, maintain a nice layer of of water around its growing tissues. Uh, eventually that moss needs to produce the spores that it uses to produce, if you'll remember that. And so we have the low growing plant and then it produces this very strange plant that grows, a separate plant in fact, that grows up out of the center of an individual plant, fills this capsule with minute little spores, loses the cap, the spores fly out into all corners and if lucky they will germinate into another little colony of uh, individual moss plants. These are each individual little moss plants, each one of them having germinated from a spore. Now moss has a very strange lifestyle. Strange but it's going to be repeated as we move through the com complexity of life plants. We saw that capsule uh, where the spores were produced in the previous slide and the little cap in the previous slide and the spores kind of shake out and they each spore then germinates into a separate plant and as it grows it begins to form those scales that are going to grab the water with their surface tension. Uh, one plant is going to produce a structure at the tip called the antheridium and inside that little sperm cells. Another plant that germinated from a different spore will grow into what we refer to as the female plant. And it's gonna form a structure called the archegonium with that wonderful 
cell, single cell called the egg. Upon fertilization, the sperm is actually motile. It can swim across that layer of water that we talk about washing over the surface of the mosses. It can swim through that and down into the archegonium. Once it fertilizes the egg, once the sperm fertilizes the egg, that begins to grow into this second plant that we saw before, the stalk that grows up out of the top of the female plant, growing up here out of the top of the female plant, the capsule filling with spores, uh, the little cap coming off, and the spores coming out again. That's the life cycle of a moss. Moving up into a little bit more complexity, uh, as I mentioned, we get the vascular system, the plumbing. And so we now have plants with proper roots and stems and leaves. The roots that anchor the plant to the ground um, absorb nutrients. The stems, which can grow up above the surface of the soil to display the leaves, which are the photosynthetic, the, the solar collectors, if you will, that drive the whole photosynthetic game that provides the nutrition for the developing plant and the nutrition to produce the reproductive structures because that's the name of the game reproducing yourself we have the ferns and the ferns again use their leaves in this case to produce specialized organs that will produce the spores and this is the golden foot polypody one of our native ferns very large-ish fern that usually grows up in the bases of, of cabbage palm trees. But ferns can be very simplistic. Here we have a fern with one large paddle-shaped leaf and another leaf that's reduced to nothing more than a stalk with what will be those spore-producing structures at the tip. You might have seen a bird's nest fern, not looking much like the previous two, but it has a leaf with vascular system and it has the spore producing structures underneath that define it as a proper fern. Anyone grow staghorn ferns? It's a proper fern. This one has two different shaped leaves. One has the flat leaf that holds the fern to the, sur the surface, what it's growing on, uh, and the fertile frond that actually reaches out into the environment, uh, covers the underside of that leaf with that spore producing um, tissue that can then, with those fingers sticking out in the air, release those spores out into the breeze. Other ferns can be even more challenging. Uh, this is a floating fern, again, not looking like any of the four previous ferns that we looked at, but it produces that um, sporangia, that typical fern sporangia that we'll meet in just a second. So when we look at the underside of a fern leaf, and I can't tell you how many times people have come into the extension office with a fern saying, oh no, there's something attacking this. There's bugs all along the underside of the leaf. And for some reason, they're all lined up in these perfect little rows. Well, those aren't bugs. Uh, these are where the spores are being produced. Um, these are not spores themselves. Let's zoom in on just one of these little dots on the underside of the golden foot polypody. We can see that it's actually a collection of little capsules. And each one of those capsules has a little zipper opening. You see those? So we have the spherical capsule with a zipper opening. And inside that tiny little capsule are the 36 or 64 individual spores. So let's just back up each one of these dots has this many sporangia, each with 36 or 64 spores. Do the math across this one single leaf at the sheer number of spores that are produced. We'll take just one of these structures, which are referred to as the sporangia with its zipper, and we'll zoom in on that. And here we have it. We have the zipper, now we're looking at it on the side. And within, you can see those little spores, single cells that are capable of germinating and growing into a completely separate plant from the parent. They're not seeds. We'll take a look at why, but these are not seeds. We haven't developed seeds yet, if you'll recall. We have to go up another order of complexity. We're still reproducing by spores. And so this is what the fern's life cycle looks like. 
There's that zipper. There's that sporangium. Here are the spores and they germinate. That spore germinates and grows into a separate plant. And that plant is called the gametophyte, G-A-M for gametophyte. And it's a heart-shaped plant about the size of your pinky nail, a couple of cell layers thick, very, very um, uh, diaphanous, very, very, um, fil not filamentous, what am I trying to say? Very thin, diaphanous, another word like that. Anyway, instead of having the spores germinate into the male plant and the female plant like they did in the mosses, both male and female are located on the same gametophyte here. We have the archegonium with the egg cell, that very important cell within, and the antheridium with the sperm cells inside. And now each one of these fern spores that grows into a gametophyte, hopefully they'll germinate near one another, and the sperm from one can swim to the archegonium of another, fertilize that egg, and then from this separate plant, from within one of these archegonia, will grow the next fern, as we know it, the part that we can see. This little plant that's called the prothallus, rarely get to see them. They're very short-lived. They only have the one job to do to produce the archegonium and antheridium uh, so that those two different cells can unite to grow into the fern frond that we recognize. Here's that prothallus in real life. You can see it's heart-shaped. We're looking at it from the top, so we're not looking at the, the archegonium and antheridium are on the underside, again, to make the most of a thin layer of water washing across to wash the sperm from one prothallus to another. And we have the young fern germinating up out of one of the archegonium from the underside of this prothallus. And we end up with the mature fern. Now we're gonna move away from reproduction by spores. We're gonna get a little bit more complex and we have the group of plants that are called the conifers. Now remember that ferns produce their sporangia on the underside of their leaf. In conifers, a short branch with its attendant leaves has been modified into what we refer to as a cone. So each scale of a cone is a modified leaf that would have had the sporangia attached. Each of those sporangia in the cones, they don't release anything. The development of the uh, egg producing and the development of the sperm producing, they all occur within this cone and another cone the egg producing uh, structures are in the female cones and the, the pollen or the sperm producing in a separate cone. Uh, so this is kind of a, a typical conifer. This is one of our native pine trees. This is the, the, the slash pine tree. But conifers come in all shapes and sizes. This is a very strange conifer that grows in the Namib Desert uh, in Africa. This is Welwitzia. And believe it or not, it's a conifer. It doesn't reproduce by spores, it reproduces by seeds. It has these two massive leaves that grow from a central disc of bark. Uh, each of the leaves gets longer and longer and longer and the desert winds whip them around and the ends of the leaves uh, break off and decay and die away, but they're always growing new photosynthetic leaves from the, uh, from the base, kind of like your hair grows if you have it. Uh, they do produce cones. They do belong to the group of conifers. And here are the cones of that crazy plant, Welwitzia. Also within this group are the cycads. A lot of people refer to these as palms, but these are actually conifers. These produce uh, cones that are specialized leaves on sh very short stems that have those uh, sperm and egg cell producing structures within that cone. The rest are the conifers that are familiar to us in landscapes, you know, the firs, the Christmas trees, the all those, these are all various conifers, mostly evergreen, but not entirely evergreen. Our, our cypress trees are actually deciduous conifers, but they still produce that cone. 
uh, that puts them firmly into this group of plants. Here we have side by side the female cone that's going to bear the, the, the sporangia that's going to produce the female archegonial and egg structure and the male cones that are going to have the uh, microsporophylls uh, that'll produce those little, uh, the pollen and the sperm cells associated with that, the, the, the small uh, gametophyte that's gonna have the sperm cell in the male cones. The male cones are brief. They only have to shed pollen and then their job is done and they drop from the trees. We're looking in cross section of an individual pollen grain so that represents uh, what would have been the, in the mosses, that little plant with the antheridium on top that was gonna have the sperm in it. Uh, this is an incredibly reduced um, antheridium cell with its attendant structures, these wings. Of course, the wings are responsible for carrying the pollen through the wind because the conifers, the ferns, and the mosses were all around long, long, long before the insects. And the only vector to get this special, um, uh, this, this special thing, the pollen, from one plant to the other was the wind. And so they have wings, uh, they're very dry, very resinous, and they stick to the female cones. So these are the very baby female cones with these modified leaves, uh, with their megaspores, uh, inside that are going to grow into the, the sporophyte that has the, the egg cell inside. Uh, the sticky surface of these female cones actually pulls the pollen grain inside to facilitate pollination. And upon pollination on the surface of one of these cone scales, uh, inside that special egg is going to develop into the seed. Shed from the female cone, each scale producing two separate seeds. And you might have seen pine seeds with their wings as well. Uh, in the absence of uh, other animals or insects to disperse the seeds, uh, they again depend on the wind. So this little wing-like appendage helps the conifer seeds escape from the parent plant. All right, is everyone following? How many people have we lost? Oh, we're doing good. We haven't lost too many. I'm gonna have a little iced tea and we'll crash on. Now we're gonna move up into the fun stuff, the flowering plants. Here we have one of the representatives of among the very first of the flowering plants. This of course is a water lily. And we mentioned before how we had that uh, in the cones, we had that short branch with the leaves that are modified. And instead of having uh, the sporangia like the ferns do that release the spores, everything stays within the confines of that modified leaf and changes into the structure that will eventually form uh, the sperm and the egg uh, while still contained within that specialized, on those specialized leaves. And here, those leaves have been modified into what we refer to in the flowering plants, of course, as the petals. And as we move further in towards the center of this water lily flower, you can see how those leaves are modified even further. And these contain uh, those structures that will produce the pollen, analogous to the antheridium of the earlier plants. Another one of the very earliest of the flowering plants is the magnolia, which you might recognize. And the cone-shaped structure that's even kind of echoed in the center of the magnolia. But the flowering plants are not conifers. They produce fruit. All flowering plants, and of course there is a huge variety, the most diverse of all the groups of plants are the flowering plants. All flowering plants produce fruit. And within the fruit, which is technically the ripened ovary, unique to this group of plants, um, the ripened ovary is referred to as a fruit. Um, this is not nutrition, this is botany. We're talking about ripened ovaries, whether they're soft and juicy or sweet, or dry and cracked open when the seeds are ripe, all flowering plants produce fruit. And the flowering plants became so incredibly diverse is 
The reason is because they came along around the time of the insects and the insects were the first creatures in the air. And so instead of having to depend on the wind and chance to facilitate pollination, uh, we now have um, a, uh, an agreement, if you will, between the flying insects and the flowering plants. Uh, they do each other these favors. Um, so the flowers can produce a nectar, which is fuel for these insects. Uh, plants also produce an abundance of pollen, enough that they can sacrifice some pollen in order to ad adhere the rest of it to their pollinator. Their pollinator might actually be feeding on the pollen. Many bees are very well suited to being pollinators. They're covered in these hairs. Uh, the pollen can stick passively to the hairs. Uh, the bees can actually attach pollen in, uh, on purpose to these hairs uh, because many bees feed on pollen. It's very, very protein rich. Flowering plants uh, display their flowers in different ways to the world, not to the world for our enjoyment, but to the world to facilitate pollination. And here we have a very simple way of presenting this flower to the world. A flat platter with these very uh, showy petals advertising that there might be a nectar reward if you crash through this little obstacle course. Um, if you get through this obstacle course right down into the center of the flower, you can receive your nectar reward. But in doing so, you'll become covered in pollen. Um, this insect who landed on this plant uh, got that yummy nectar reward. It's going to go and it's look for. It's going to go and look for an identical shaped petal arrangement, an identical shaped anther arrangement, knowing that it's going to get the same reward. Uh, the good news for the plant is that it's going to be visiting a member of its own species and transferring the pollen to a member of its own species so that the pollen can fertilize uh, the egg cells contained within the ovary, produce the fruit, and reproduce the plant. Another pollination syndrome, this plant, the morning glory, has a tubular flower that forces the pollinator to crawl down into this dark tunnel in order to get its nectar reward and in so doing, brushing up against the pollen bearing structures and the pollen receiving structures on the other end. Uh, we also have uh, extremely tubular shaped flowers. This is one of our native air plants, one of the Tillandsias, and they have these very long, brightly colored, tubular shaped flowers uh, with their pollen way out here outside the flower. This configuration is perfect to put your pollen right on the head of a visiting hummingbird. So hummingbird sticks its long beak way down into the base of this flower to get its nectar reward, and the plant dusts very lightly the pollen on that hummingbird's head. So when hummingbird goes and visits another flower that's shaped the same way, hopefully the same, very likely the same species, it's gonna transfer that pollen to the next flower. Um, here is across a longitudinal section through a, a schematic flower. There's all kind of words that go along with this. Here are the important ones. We have the stamen, which produces the pollen that is collected by the pollinator, and it's transferred to the stigma growing through, down through, and into the ovary, where it pollinates the ovules that become the seeds. That's how flowering plants work. And remember, if it's not a moss, a fern, or a conifer, it's a flowering plant. Everything out there, whether you've noticed its flower or not, if you've ever grown a tomato, uh, here we have all the words of the flower and fruit. Let's strip it down to what we need to know. Again, the ovary with the ovules inside, the stamen with the pollen. Um, pollen fertilizes the little ovules inside the egg cells inside that become the seed contained within a fruit, a ripened ovary containing mature seeds, which are the result of pollination and fertilization of those, of those ovules is a fruit. Tomato is a fruit. Smoothie. Ketchup is not a smoothie. Um, Flowering plants, we go through the flower bud, the flowering, 
and then all the extra bits fall away. The petals, the stamens, all that, and the ovary ripens into the mature fruit. And ripening and fruit and mature, those are all botanical terms. But let's look at something that's a little bit more challenging. Here we have a flowering plant called the peanut. It's a legume and the flowers are produced, the pollinators are attracted, pollen is transferred, fertilization takes place, pollination and then fertilization takes place, and then the plant pushes its ovary underground. It actually bends over and pushes that ovary underground, and the ovary then begins to ripen. The ovules inside begin to ripen and mature, Inside those ovules, the ovules become the seed. Inside the seed is the little embryo that will become the next plant. So a peanut is a fruit because it's a ripened ovary. And within that ripened ovary is the fertilized egg that has now become a viable seed with an embryo that has the, um, it has the nutrition that it needs from those little seed leaves, those little cotyledons. So a peanut is a fruit because it contains a seed. We'll look at this um, oak. In the springtime, you know the oaks shed all these um, kind of brownish caterpillar looking things. Um, the oaks are producing pollen. Uh, these are flowering plants that have abandoned insect pollinators. They've gone back to uh, using the wind as a pollinator. And so those little curtains of things that fall down off the trees, those are the male flowers. These flowers only produce anthers. These are separate kinds of flowers on the same plant. So the male flowers produce all that pollen, all those clouds of pollen early in the spring. And then once these tiny little individual male flowers on their strings are done shedding their pollen, they drop away from the tree. They're not contributing. Um, they're not getting anything more from the tree. Their job is done. But the female flowers, which again might challenge your idea of what a flower looks like, here is an oak. Here's a female oak flower. That's all you get. You get that receptive uh, stigma. You have the ovary here. That's all you get. Stigma, ovary, stigma is gonna catch that airborne pollen. Pollen has not not got a very far way to grow to transfer the, uh, to fertilize the egg cell, that single egg cell within this uh, large ovary. And after, after pollination and fertilization, uh, that ovary begins to swell. And it swells into what we know as the acorn. We still have that little stigmatic surface, uh, but the ovary is growing and growing with the embryo inside uh, contained within, uh, the seed contained within, in this case, the fruit is called a nut with that hard shell. Uh, so that too makes a flowering plant producing this fruit. So remember, of all the groups of plants, there's only four you need to worry about. The mosses, very simple, spore producing. A little bit more complicated, the ferns, still reproducing by spores, but they've got the complex leaves and stems, and roots, uh, furthering along the complexity. Uh, no more spores. We've actually encased our embryo uh, with some nutrition within a structure called a seed. Uh, so the embryo is now well fed inside of a seed. Um, the seeds are produced within cones. Those are the conifers. And finally, flowers with their uh, wonderful invention, the ovary with the ovules inside, the ovary ripening into a protective, uh, nutrition bearing, uh, and often um, dispersal facilitating structure. The juicy sweet fruits with the seeds inside, you can imagine what their dispersal mechanism is. They're actually inviting something to eat that fruit to then walk away from the parent plant, excrete what they didn't digest, often in the form of the seeds that will then germinate far away from the parent plant. So those are the four major groups of plants. Four very different. 
a long kind of a timeline, if you will, from the most uh, earliest of the diverging land plants up to the most complex, the flowering plants. But what do they all have in common? What makes all these things plants? And if you'll remember, simply put, a plant is a living, a multicellular organism, things with lots of cells, they take sunlight and turn it into sugar. All four of these groups of plants can do that. Um, and they have a very special cell wall. Here we have a plant cell. And if you've ever taken biology, um, they usually start you off with the cell and you get all these horrible words and that makes you not wanna study biology anymore. Uh, that's why we wanna do this the other way around. Let's take a look at what we already know and what we can already relate to. And now we're gonna take a look at what they all have in common. Um, and let's rip away all those show off words and get down to what's really important when we're talking about a plant cell. They have a cell wall, which is unique to plants. They have a chloroplast, which is unique to plants. And they have this central vacuole, uh, which is unique to plants. Everything else is found in all other cells and not necessarily very important for today. Just know that cells can reproduce. Okay, fine. But plant cells, when they reproduce, they get to have these three very unique and cool structures. Uh, the vacuole, the cell wall, and the chloroplast. The cell walls are rigid and they allow plants to stand up, right? They allow them to defy gravity uh, and be upstanding. Plants, of course, don't have skeletons, but they do need to stand up. And so the rigid cell walls help keep plants upstanding. Cellulose um, is a very important um, carbohydrate made from all these wonderful chemical bonds that give me the creeps. Uh, but cellulose is a very important plant fiber, structure, material. Cellulose is what facilitates the dispersal of cotton. And of course, humans have taken advantage of this type of cellulose uh, and made a fabric. Uh, if you think about cellulose uh, in terms of humans taking cellulose and turning it into papyrus, uh, enabling early civilizations to make records of their lives and of their histories and of their beliefs. Uh, papyrus eventually becoming paper uh, and, and human civilization becoming even more advanced, if you will, um, or at least different in a different way. Uh, paper, again, facilitating more record keeping, uh, the arts to um, emerge, uh, eventually books and the printing press, and we all know how uh, these kind of advancements have furthered the human uh, condition. This all happened because plants can produce cellulose. How cool is that? The central vacuole is a, is a space where the plant can uh, store water and become very, very turgid, it's called, very, very stiff. Uh, and it can draw on that reserve in times of drought if there's no water that it can draw up through its roots, it can take advantage of this central storage area, this vacuole. Uh, once the vacuole becomes to get depleted, the plant will begin to wilt. It loses that turgidity. The chloroplasts are arguably the most important part of a plant cell. Uh, the chloroplast, let's take a look at one of those. It's these little green spots within each one of these individual plant cells. And the chloroplast, let's strip away extra words like magic. Um, the chloroplast within has a stack of things called the thylakoid. And within the thylakoid is the chlorophyll. Chlorophyll is that magic stuff that can take sunlight and turn it into sugar. Chloroplasts also have their own DNA, separate from the parent plant. The parent plant's DNA is going to be in the nucleus of that plant cell, but the chloroplast has its own. And it's pretty well agreed upon that the chloroplast developed from this thing. Let's rip away this 
is an individual bacteria cell. This is what's referred to as the blue-green algae. It used to be called blue-green algae, but we don't call it algae anymore because that kind of complicates things. It's a, it's a bacteria. This is cyanobacteria. This is photosynthetic bacteria. Existed well before plants. It's what res is responsible for the majority of the early oxygen. It's what created the early Earth atmosphere, uh, these photosynthetic bacteria. It's believed, and it's pretty well agreed upon, that these photosynthetic bacteria were ingested by a single cell way, many times, way, way, way long ago. And instead of being digested, uh, it was actually kind of kept captive and continued to produce through photosynthesis those carbohydrates that the engulfing uh, cell fed upon and became an internal structure. So that blue-green algae became the uh, chloroplast of a plant cell. Still has its own DNA, still reproduces itself. What happens in photosynthesis, no matter how they got, no matter how the chloroplasts got there, uh, what happens within a plant cell is that sunlight shines upon the thylakoids uh, where water is broken apart and the hydrogen is stripped off. The oxygen is released. As we know, plants give off oxygen. The hydrogen is then handed over to another cycle where carbon dioxide is broken up and the carbon mixes with the hydrogen and forms carbohydrate. And carbohydrate is sugar. So schematically, we've got the sun taking carbon dioxide, running it through this wonderful system of photosynthesis, and releasing oxygen and sugar that is then available for everything above plants on the food chain. And of course, sugars can be turned into carbohydrates and so on, all these other wonderful things. Everyone okay? How are we doing on dropouts? Oh, y'all are still there. That's fantastic. Couple more things plants have in common from the mosses, to the flowering plants are hormones. Now we mentioned early on that the plants can't go anywhere, they can't get up and run away. They have to adapt in place to uh, environmental stimuli, uh, threats, advantages, opportunities, all these things. Plants have to adapt right where they're growing and hormones can facilitate that adaptation on a very, very short time scale. It's hormones that are produced that cause seedlings to move towards the light. It's hormones that trigger the cells on this side of this seedling uh, to elongate. And the cells on this side of the stem that's closest to the light to not elongate, which causes the whole plant to bend towards the light. That's a hormonal um, message that's sent uh, to overcome, to compensate for the fact that the sun isn't directly overhead. Gravity, hormones can actually overcome gravity. At some point in this tree's life, uh, this cliff bank uh, let go from underneath and the gravity was sensed and the hormones uh, were able to inform this tree to begin an upward trajectory, um, trying to upright the tree uh, to make the most of the um, sunlight coming from above. Hormones do a billion things. Well, not a billion, but a whole lot of things. Um, they contribute to uh, things like when is my flower bud going to open? When is everything just right? When you get signals from day length and temperature uh, though, uh, or several other uh, stimuli, that leads to the creation of the hormone that forces that bud to break its dormancy. Uh, the speed and the timing that fruit ripens uh, can, is also oftentimes controlled by the actions of hormones. 
uh, we mentioned stem elongation in the, the, little, the little seedlings bending towards the light. Uh, when do you shed leaves uh, in response to day length and temperature in the temperate areas? Uh, when do you drop your autumn leaves? Or do you drop your leaves as a result of some other stimulus like a lack of, of water? Perhaps after a prolonged drought, it might be worth losing all your leaves and just hoping that the rains come back so you can produce a new flush. Uh, lots of things that the hormones uh, regulate in plants. And we're really still studying uh, the amazing effects because hormones act in such incredibly small quantities. Um, they're so, so bioactive in such small quantities. And um, it's even been said that the similarities between hormonal mechanisms in plants and animals um, just show how fundamentally the same life is, even though life has developed into all these wonderful and various things. We all, all forms of life um, have some very basic fundamental similarities. And we'll finish up with the plant meristem. This is, the meristem is uh, that bit of the plant, usually right at the tip, uh, that's very active in growing and dividing. It's a, it's a site of a lot of uh, hormonal production and activity. Um, and in the meristem tissues, uh, you have cells that can become just about anything. Um, they are stem cells, if you've heard of them before. Um, stem cells are those cells that, given the right uh, hormones or stimulation or some other kind of environmental, uh, they can become anything. So perhaps cells that were on their way to becoming uh, a side shoot or cells that were on their way into becoming uh, a bunch of flowers or cells that were on their way to becoming a leaf uh, under the right conditions, uh, under the right stimuli, under the right presence or absence of certain hormones, those cells can be converted into something else. And that is classic uh, for those of you who might be gardeners uh, where you take a bit of stem and you convince that plant to stop producing leaves, uh, stop producing branches, and instead turn the efforts into producing roots into what normally wouldn't have been an area of root production. Uh, so that is how um, that could be a survival mechanism for certain plants. Let's say that something in nature caused this branch to snap and fall on the ground. Instead of it being curtains, uh, or despite that being the end of it for the, that branch, uh, the stimulus, uh, the absence of the presence of certain hormones as a result of that stimulus uh, could cause that broken branch to then grow into a separate plant. So uh, it's a survival mechanism and it works uh, and has worked throughout forever. So botanical science for beginner, 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 beginners, which is us, we're just getting started and there is so much more to learn. I really hope that you've enjoyed today's presentation. I will certainly be in touch once this presentation is available on our YouTube channel. It's Florida Supernature on our YouTube channel. Uh, thanks for joining us today. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to email me. My email address is right here under my picture. If you have any questions, comments, complaints. I want to keep you to time. Don't want to take up too much more of your afternoon. But again, thanks for joining us today. It's James Stevenson with the University of Florida IFAS Extension here in Pinellas County. Thanks so much.